Greetings, this is Dr. Michael Guth, and in 2011 I was invited to deliver a talk at an executive forum for diabetes practice management. My talk was actually divided into two parts. The first part of the talk, which is the subject of today's video, concerns glucose, the silent killer. My affiliation is shown on this next slide. I am Director of Health Economics and Outcomes Research at Risk Management Consulting in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. The deadly effects of even slightly elevated glucose are fatally misunderstood. Most physicians rely on obsolete, normal blood glucose ranges rather than seeking or advising their patients on the optimal serum glucose levels. The optimal values are 80 milligrams per deciliter or below. This is for the fasting glucose test. People today suffer and die from diabetes complications without knowing that their glucose levels are too high. The definition of what it means to have an impaired fasting glucose has evolved um, over time, but from 1979 to 1997, the American Diabetes Association dictated that diagnosis with fasting glucose of 140 milligrams per deciliter or higher on two separate occasions. Seven, the threshold was lowered to 126, and today the fasting impaired fasting glucose values are defined to be 100 milligrams per deciliter or higher. Now those with glucose above 85 milligrams per deciliter face a 40 percent increased risk of fatal heart attacks. This was the conclusion of a fairly large 22-year follow-up study of healthy non-diabetic men and it was published in Diabetes Care 1999. From that same study, we have the following quotation. Fasting blood glucose values in the upper normal range appear to be an important independent predictor of cardiovascular death in non-diabetic, apparently healthy, middle-aged men. So what this means is we have Patients who did the honorable thing, had their blood tested, and learned that they were not diabetic, they were in the normal range, and yet their values fell somewhere between 85 and 100. And what we observed, or what was observed in that particular study, was that they then have a 40% increased risk of fatal heart attacks simply from having glucose above 85 versus below 85, or actually below 80. There are some lessons that can be learned from the age management medicine literature. And one lesson is that maturing individuals, that is those beginning say at age 40 or 45, they need to take aggressive actions to ensure their fasting and postprandial glucose levels are kept in safe ranges. Well, what are some of those aggressive actions? They should adopt a low glycemic diet that would include eliminating all sugar products. So all cakes, cookies, brownies, anything that tastes sweet should be eliminated from the pantry and the refrigerator. Um, they should also avoid the white foods which include white pasta, white bread, white potatoes, and white rice. Each of those four are very high in starches which cause glucose spikes when they are consumed and metabolized in the body. Glucose is like gasoline. Spilled gasoline, excess glucose, creates a highly combustible environment for oxidative stress and inflammation. There are three clinical practice issues for doctors related to glucose levels. First, we pose a question. What percentage of doctors would see fasting glucose values of 85 to 100 milligrams per deciliter and tell their patients everything is fine? Well, the truth is the vast majority of doctors, especially primary care doctors, family medicine doctors, they believe that that normal range is indeed fine. But as we've shown from this study and from others like it, in fact, 
those serum glucose levels above 80 place you at higher risk for eventual fatal heart attacks. Medical malpractice is based on the standard of care for a typical physician in a given state. This provides incentives for doctors to engage in herd-like behavior and by that a doctor looks around in his medical community and sees when patients have fasting glucose levels in between 85 and 100 we normally assume that's fine and so we don't put the patient on any particular treatment or warn the patient that he or she needs to lower those fasting glucose levels to their optimal values. Because of that it would be very hard to prove medical malpractice when essentially all of the other doctors in town or in the state are practicing the same way and just accepting that normal range. However, there is a future trend. Patients are learning more and more about health through the internet and they're becoming better informed. And as they become better informed, they expect a standard of care above the old norm. Why is any excess glucose dangerous? Number one, it causes multiple diseases of aging. These would include cardiovascular disease, cerebrovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, and even some of the autoimmune diseases. There is a 38% increased risk in death from digestive tract cancers when there is excess glucose in the body. So this is colon cancer, stomach cancer, pancreatic cancer. In general, all forms of cancer love excess glucose and consume it at a much faster rate than normal healthy cells. I leave this as a question for the proverbial interested reader, but I believe you will find that cancer cells tend to consume twice as much glucose or consume glucose at twice the rate of ordinary normal cells. In fact, they may consume it at even more than twice, but at least twice that rate. A third cause for concern is that diabetics suffer such horrific incidences of vascular disorders that some experts believe that coronary atherosclerosis, this is when uh, plaques are forming in the arteries and the plaques are made up of very low density lipoproteins as well as calcium and other kind of excess waste products. And the experts believe, or some experts believe that this uh, coronary atherosclerosis and diabetes should be classified as the same disease. There is a drug that is available. It is in generic form and it can be purchased from pharmacies such as Walmart. A 90-day supply would be $10. The name of the drug is metformin and I have a quotation here from Dr. Ward Dean who is a very strong proponent of metformin and has written, gosh, probably more than two dozen articles related to diabetes care and practice management. Um, when I just want to point out in this quotation that I have in my talk that I do not agree with um, everything Dr. Ward says here. I personally take 1,000 milligrams of metformin daily, that is two of the 500 milligram extended release capsules daily but I have not found that it lowers cholesterol and triglycerides. It definitely does not lower cortisol. It does not normalize blood pressure. Um, the reason I take it is that it causes at the cellular level um, increased insulin sensitivity and as we age we become less sensitive and more resistant to insulin and that's why he was saying we are all becoming diabetics in the sense that just the simple process of aging causes us to develop insulin resistance. There are 27 correctable obesity inducers and these are different factors that could cause um, obesity in adults as well as diabetes but they involve such things as postprandial hyperglycemia um, that is uh, very high excess sugar following eating a meal excess calorie in, intake, excess amylase. Amylase is an enzyme that's used by the body to convert carbohydrates into sugar. And there are another 24 different of these daggers. I will talk about those at length in a separate video. 
If you are interested in the topics we have mentioned, please do not hesitate to contact me. I am always happy to speak to interested viewers of these videos. The best way to reach me is by email, which is mike at michaelguth.com, and guth is spelled G-U-T-H dot com. And my phone number, if you don't have access to email, so kind of a second way of contacting me, but I prefer to get email from um, interested readers, would be phone 865-483-8309. Thank you.